everybody to today's NA3RC and IQ Consortium Microphysiological Systems webinar and workshop series. Today we are going to be talking specifically about kidney MPS. As a disclaimer, this webinar and workshop series is made up of companies who may be competitors or customers of one another. Accordingly, nothing discussed during these webinars and workshops are intended to result in agreement on price, exclude suppliers from any market, or otherwise restrain competition. Those participating in this webinar and workshop series are instructed to avoid discussion of competitive, competitively sensitive subjects, including costs, prices, sales, product marketing, and other confidential information. In addition, neither the NA3RC nor the IQ will use contact information received during this collaboration for marketing purposes or engage in marketing or sales conduct during collaboration activities. Um, so we're going to start off with a brief introduction to the NA3RC, the IQ, and the webinar series. So I am Megan LaFollette. Um, I am Program Director at the North American 3Rs Collaborative. We are a nonprofit that collaborates to advance better science for both people and animals. We do this through facilitating 3Rs efforts focused on refinement, reduction, and replacement. We partner with individuals across the field. This is a picture of our leadership team and board of directors, um, and hopefully you can appreciate from their institutional logos. It really spans across academia, industry, consultants, government, other nonprofits, and biotechnology companies, and more. And we generally look for initiatives that have ample evidence, impact, and practicality which of course we see microphysiological systems as an important replacement um, to help and we want to help increase adoption and regulatory acceptance of them. Our initiative includes 40 different member institutions and over 70 individual members. These are primarily commercially available um, technology providers, um, although we also include a few end users and other individuals. And we generally aim to do five things, providing thought leadership, um, facilitating discussion, um, creating engagement between developers and regulatory agencies, um, developing external partnerships, and creating resources. We do this through our four work streams. Um, this work stream really coordinates um, with end users. Um, we coordinate with regulatory agencies. We have created a technology expo, and we provide general education. Um, we have been engaging consistently with end users since our beginning. Um, we were founded in 2020, so in 2021, we kind of started this workshop series. Um, we're continuing it. I'm very excited that we are now able to offer these webinars um, open to all MPS stakeholders, and we will be posting um, the recording um, with kind of timelines, chapters um, on our YouTube channel so that it's very easy to reference it um, after this presentation. Um, we're also making progress with our other groups in terms of regulatory aspects. Um, I won't really go into this too much, but we have done a couple presentations um, and you can view this on our website. Um, same with education. We've got some really general MPS um, educational presentations um, and efforts. Again, you can see this um, on our website. You can also visit our technology hub um, after this if you want to find any of the individual providers or other providers. And right now you can sort by organ type, but in the future we want to add disease area as well as species. Um, like I said, previous um, presentations that are more general on our, our website and we will be adding functionality to look at all of the webinars and workshops as well. So um, we have kind of two different formats. Um, webinars are really institutional agnostic and focused on general education, whereas workshops, which is what is today, these are the companies are going to be presenting information about their specific commercially available MPS systems. Um, so this is the schedule for today. Um, Mimetis may or may not be joining us. Um, so that is still pending, but we will have at least five providers. Um, these times are in EST, and um, it's kind of up to how much time the providers take as to whether or not there will be a Q&A during their presentation. And if not, you can always ask Q&A in the chat um, or um, save them for the end. Um, this is where you find the Q&A button, um, but again, you can also put it in the chat if you are struggling. And with that, I will turn it over to our representative from the IQ. Okay, can we see that okay? Yep, looks good. Perfect. Um, 
So I'm just going to give a quick overview of the IQ MPS. Um, my name is David Kukla, um, and I am part of the IQ MPS affiliate, and I specifically serve on the strategic partnerships and communications team. And the IQ MPS is currently composed of 22 member companies, um, and we have representatives from Drug Safety, uh, 3Rs, um, ADME, and PDPK. And our leadership team is currently made up of Rhiannon Hardwick and Anya Kopek. And also, um, we have a steering committee that is made up of two individuals from every company. And the IQMPS has four uh, main goals uh, to serve as a thought leader for both NPS developers and stakeholder organizations, um, provide a venue for appropriate cross pharma collaboration and data sharing, uh, to create focused engagement between industry and regulatory agencies, uh, as well as to develop external partnerships and collaborations. And here are the IQMPS um, affiliate work streams including uh, manuscript publications, a regulatory outreach, um, proof of concept studies through uh, pilot project teams, a strategic partnerships and communication team, as well as landscape gap survey team. And here's just an overview of our external partnerships over the past few years. Um, and just for the sake of time, I'm just gonna focus more um, on the recent years. And within 2021, we co-partnered with the NA3RC and established an MOU, which has allowed us to work together on webinars and workshops such as this one, um, as well as we engaged with external contacts such as uh, the Advanced Regenerative Manufacturing Institute, as well as the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Additionally, we've provided a year end update and an overview landscape assessment through uh, our survey. Um, and that's kind of all I have for right now, but um, feel free to reach out if you have any questions specifically about the IQ, um, and I'm happy to help out with that. Um, thank you so much. Espros uh, is basically a company started by Mike Schuller and myself uh, about seven years ago. We've licensed uh, about 20 patents from Cornell and UCF. Mike and I won the Lush Prize for Alternative Animals. Uh, we've developed a lot of technology and SBIR grants. Um, actually, the kidney work I'm going to show you today is in the process of being developed with SBIR grants. Um, it's also, we have contracts with national and international pharma companies. We have a 14,000 square foot facility here in uh, Orlando. We have about 45 um, um, people at the company at present. We are CRO, um, so basically uh, we don't offer any of our projects. And also we just, uh, we have, we're the first microbiological system where efficacy data uh, was used to repurpose from one of our systems, um, a drug um, in an IND that was allowed to proceed to a clinical trial. And that's in a phase two clinical trial now. Um, so what I've, really working on for the last 25, 30 years, this idea of clinically relevant functional readouts, um, where you basically have, you go into a doctor's office, he doesn't immediately, you know, stick a needle in your arm to look for biomarkers. He basically, how you walking, how you talking, listens to your heart, uh, basically um, checks your reflexes. These are all clinically relevant functional readouts. So we can actually have muscle contraction, electrical activity, neuromuscular junction information, um, barrier integrity. These are all a carlet, and we can do this all without cell death, okay? That's the really key, is you wanna be able to have these neuronal systems, um, these cardiac systems uh, patterned over microelectrodes, you know, basically have thin layers of cardiac cells uh, or skeletal muscle monotubes on cantilevers, so when they contract, they bend, we can measure the force. We can still look at biomarkers, we do the monitor liver, and we look at tear in these sets of trans uh, epithelial electro resistance. Um, this is kind of how it works. Um, you can basically see these are all the functional aspects, and these are each individual chips. What we do is we culture out the cells, okay, on each chip separately. Then we assemble them all into this platform, put down a membrane to establish the fluidic connections. And now these are all fluidically connected. And then we put the top on where we have the connections for the electrical act uh, activity, and we have the windows at the bottom to be able to put the laser into the system. Um, 
We've developed many barrier tissue um, systems. Uh, we've worked with L'Oreal, um, create a five organ system, including skin. Uh, we have looked at proximal tube um, in these systems, integrated uh, for um, um, efficacy, but I'm going to talk about some advances we've had on that. But I mean, barrier systems, Mike, was, Mike Schuller was one of the ones who uh, pioneered that, um, and GI tract systems. Uh, we've also been able to put um, recirculating immune cells in these systems. This was published in Advanced Science um, uh, in collaboration with Roche, uh, basically showing we could put monocytes in it. What we're able to do is to show the, um, that we can activate either the restorative or the inflammatory monocytes in these systems. And we've also been able to create uh, pharmacodynamic, 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 pharmacodynamic relationships with these systems, where we can account for absorption of compound in the systems, account for metabolism, to be able to get the pharmacokinetics, but also the pharmacodynamics, be able to look at the outside of cardiac cells and the inside. And this was published in Nature Scientific Reports with AstraZeneca, um, which kind of leads me to, you know, kind of where we're at with the kidney in that we can take these PBPA models. Um, Mike had shown years ago that he could take those equations, be able to design a multi-organ system. This is one of our more advanced systems. We're looking at opioid overdose, um, where we're looking at um, opioids, treating it, and then looking at naloxone to reverse it. But main thing, looking at off-target toxicity, it, is it contains a kidney module in the system. Lastly, we can actually um, look at, it, it's a pump system, so all the tubing and all the pumps and everything are gone. We use gravity to pump it. The nice thing about that, it makes it less complex, gets rid of the bubbles. It also makes it a low volume system. So we can see the, uh, the effect of both parent and metabolite in the same system without having to identify what the metabolite is. So this was an initial system in terms of a two, ki two uh, digital kidney microfluidic system that we had, um, where you can basically see the, um, uh, the different fluid streams into the system. They you have the tear, I'll be able to have the blood flow to be able to look at the initial um, kidney system, okay? Um, we want to say basically have the um, uh, renal proximal tube cells. We can actually grow them in the system. We can grow them in the membrane. Uh, they have the, the right markers for kidney cells and be able to show that they express the uh, correct markers for kidney cells in terms of uh, gamma glutamyl transferase and alkylate phosphatase. Um, and you can basically see that the co-localization of those systems. Um, we can actually look at tier during the 28-day um, experiment and show that the uh, goes up over 28-day uh, experiment compared to static trans wells where we really don't get any uh, development of the system over time like we can see in the flow environment. You're able to look at um, uh, secretion of the digoxin and metformin in the system determined by HPLC uh, and be able to see that you, know, you can dose it and actually then see the transport okay, of both of the compounds in the kidney system. Um, we can also show that uh, we can inhibit glucose transport uh, with uh, uh, and fluoxazine, um, where you basically show that you can have the time you inhibit that, and you can also then look at the uh, glucose transport in terms of the hours, in terms of the um, uh, with and without the uh, blocker in the system. Okay, so we get proper barrier function and transport with the kidney system. And it's basically showing how the, um, uh, the damage of different compounds show to look at the transport, okay, um, for uh, different molecules in terms of uh, IL-8 secretion response to the compound treatment. You see it goes up with certain molecules known to damage kidney. Looking at the uh, lipocalin uh, two secretion again, Looking at that, and again, we see that with cisplatin, which is a known kidney toxin, and the KIM-1 excretion with most of these in terms of the uh, these three showed an increase in kidney damage, which is what you'd expect with those compounds. And again, you compare it to the control, uh, you see that um, these do not cause uh, KIM-1 secretion. They do show some damage with the other markers, though, as well. So we can actually then look in terms of kidney as a uh, tox target. However, what we want to really do is develop a five organ model, determine uh, nephrotoxicity of acute and chronic compound testing. 
and also better predict elimination pharmacokinetics and add new tox because he's already developed we can do absorption, distribution, metabolism, okay, and toxicity in our multi-organ systems. We've published this with L'Oreal. We've published this with AstraZeneca, with Roche. But we, and as far as I know, nobody else can do elimination. So what we want to do is have glomerular endothelial cells, apodocytes, mesenchymal cells, and be able to look at and have the organ functional readout in this multi-organ system. Um, this is a uh, our first uh, attempt at this, where we actually had two different systems um, integrated with each other, uh, where we can actually look at the blood flow, transport to the glomerulus, be able to look at the fil filtrate flow, and then transport through the proximal tube to be able to see that recirculation and return in the system. Um, and then what we can do, we can then, in the five organ system, we can look at the effect of the different compounds on conduction velocity, on beat frequency, cardiac force, uh, SIP activity in these systems, and values in terms of the, um, uh, the effect of tear in these and then skeletal muscle force, all in this multi-organ system. Um, we can actually then look at the renal corpuscle cells in the multi-organ system and the serum-free media, showing that we're getting a good barrier for, uh, in the system. You basically see we have the correct markers of interest. Um, and be able to show that the tier is uh, maintained um, in, in terms of physiological relevance and being a very constant uh, value. And I think we can also then get the um, uh, small and large dextran filtration for renal corpuscle in a single tissue system, showing that the, um, the lower molecular weight, okay, um, transports faster than the higher molecular weight. And this is maintained at day three, day seven, up to day 10. Um, and then we look at the uh, excretory physiology of the transporters in terms of the um, sodium uh, um, hydronium ion uh, exchanger, uh, the ZL1 and, and uh, markers. And be able to show we have the uh, excretory transport proteins and for the uh, uh, sodium uh, uh, hydrogen ion exchanger and the acroporin 1 in the system. Um, so again, we've now taken that system and made this multi-organ system, including kidney, be able to look at overdose. This is the basic the system that we can do. And as I showed you earlier, this is how we can assemble them. They're very flexible. Um, we can they're interchangeable. We can put out, take out one chip, put in a different chip. We, this could be a blood-brain barrier or a GI tract, and you have examples of that. Um, you know, we are these snap oils are no longer. Um, uh, available, so we've switched that to a different membrane system. And again, lastly, we are developing a uh, pharmacokinetic, pharmacokinetic model, model with this system, with NIH, where we can then predict using in vitro a PKPD to predict in vivo outcomes. Um, and then lastly, just to, as I mentioned before, we had um, developed a system that was in an IND, that, which was allowed to um, proceed to a clinical trial. What we did for a rare disease, we want to look at conduction velocity for CIDP, uh, complement-induced uh, demyelinating polyneuropathy. We looked at conduction velocity by looking at uh, electrodes, uh, axons over the electrodes, be able to see that, which is, again, a clinically relevant functional readout. We were able to then look at the untreated system uh, with the serum up from the patient, nice that control, and then with their molecule, which is with Sanofi. And be able to show that the um, uh, for the control we maintained that range of frequencies it was abolished with their isotype control, but their molecule um, uh, preserved that. And again, this went into a clinical trial, which is active as of April of 2021, and was published in Advanced Therapeutics with Sanofi. So, um, thank you for um, listening to our presentation. Um, and um, the, the kidney systems are in, in development. I mean, really what we eventually want to have is a complete admitox model. And we're currently um, working on the elimination. We have rudimentary systems. We hope to eventually get to a system one day where we can do complete admitox. And we're in uh, development for that as well. So any questions? 
Awesome. Yes. Thank you, James, for the presentation. Um, if anyone has any questions, um, you can either put them in the chat. Um, otherwise, I will also go ahead and enable the Q&A um, real quick. We do have just a few minutes if anybody has any. Otherwise, we may save them for the roundtable. Awesome. OK, so we will save questions for the roundtable. Um, if you want to go ahead and um, unshare your screen and then call in from New Cells, you can go ahead and unmute and share your screen and go from there. Looks good. That, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. OK, well, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, my name's uh, Colin Brown. I'm the Chief Innovations Officer at New Cells Biotech in, uh, in Newcastle in, in the north of England. Um, we have been working to generate best in biology models. And today I want to tell you about our approximate high throughput 24 and 96 well MPS uh, flow plate, which we've just developed. Now, we've been working on kidney for, for more than 10 years, and we are well known for our approximate static model. So we grow cells, uh, primary cells from human, dog, rat, mouse and uh, NHP. We um, grow these as monolayers upon um, filtered um, transvalve filter supports. What we have found, and just summarizing a lot of data, what we found is when we grow them as trans on transvalve filter supports, they reform a monolayer, the junctions form, reform, so you have a, a, a functional barrier, and the transporters from the apical side are all expressed on the apical side of the of the monolayer and the transporters from the basolateral side all expressed in the basolateral side. We, pr we produced a, a lot of data and done over a hundred studies with, with the majority of pharma companies. Um, we are well, very predictive, both in terms of ADME and in TOX. So we, we, and we do small molecules and large molecules. So we're well known for this. What we wanted to do was take our model, which was already well established, as really good biology, expressing transporters and really representing the kidney, and trying to improve it by um, by introducing uh, flow into the system. So we decided to stay with um, with transwells for several reasons. So some of the reasons were that they're well established. We can do high throughput. We can do nine to six well plate format easily. They have a large surface area, so we so we can use them for radio radio labeled and non radio labeled flux assays, which we do all the time. We also can measure biomarkers um, of toxicity, for example, Kim one N Gal, NAG, osteopointin. We can lyse the cells, and there's enough cells in the system that if you want to lyse the cells, then you can see what's inside the cells. So you can quantify uptake, accumulation of drug molecules within the cells. We can use clear inserts and therefore they're available to, to use for um, high content screening and um, it, immunohistochemistry. And also we have enough media in, in our system that you, you can actually quantify microRNA uh, uh, and, and extract exosomes, which we've done in another collaboration. So how, how do we move from our system to make it MPS? Well, the first thing we do is that in our initial model, then you grow cells within the within the transwell. This is a standard way. So in our new system, what we do is we move the trans the, the, the cells to the bottom of the transwell. So we grow the cells in the bottom of the transwell. And this allows us to expose them to, to flow. So how do we do that? Well, to do that, we designed a set of, of filter holders. And this one shows an example. This is our 96 well plate. Each of the transwells is individually um, has individual flow to it. Essentially, we take our approximate cells, we grow them on the 96 well, well filter supports, for, and then after 24 hours, we invert these and then push them, place them into the filter holders. So essentially, um, if we look in more detail, then for each of the wells, each well is a standard transwell, except it has that that the um, when we push the filter in, then the filter forms the, the 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 closure at the bottom of the well. 
in addition to the, the well itself, on each side of the well, we have two reservoirs. And these reservoirs are connected together by a channel which run, runs underneath each individual well. So that each trans well sits with its, the cells hanging down into the chamber with fluid on underneath in the, cham in, the cha in the channel and the two reservoirs. Just to show that in more detail there, here's the setup here. So this is an individual one, here's the reservoir, here's the other reservoir on the other side of the transwell. The transwell bridges a gap, forms the roof of a channel, and the channel volume is 95 microliters. So that every single transwell on this 96 watt plate is under the same, um, has the same format, so they're all individually under flow. So how do we generate flow? Just as we heard in the previous slide, we've done away with the idea of having pumping and we just use a rocking motion. So this is a very early one where we, we had three transwells in a row. Essentially, there's the um, vertical reservoir. There's the vertical reservoir on the other side. Here's the channel underneath. This is a, this is a transwell. So the transwell cells, the, the, the filters at the bottom here, the cells hang into the flow. And therefore, if you rock it, then the fluid moves from one side to the other side. Then if you rock in the other direction, the fluid moves backwards. And by um, altering the, the angle and also the, the speed at which you, it, you rock the system, then you can generate a very nice um, shear stress uh, of about, well, you can vary it, but for our cells, um, 0 0.2 uh, um, um, times per centimeter squared, it, it does, does work really well. So we've actually patented this. We've patented the 24 and the 96 well version of it. So that's how we generate stress. So we can just rock this, um, either a 24 or 96 well. So does it work? So the first thing to look at is barrier function, because we want to recreate a barrier so we can make, measure um, trans, trans epithelial fluxes. And also we can measure um, the release of, of biomarkers into the apical uh, solution. So you can see here, this is um, the generation of tear over days. This is the, the light bars are the static, the cells grown, but not under flow. So they're just grown and held on the bottom of the filter in the system, but not, not sh shaken. These are the ones which are rocked. And you can see that both systems um, over a period of days, after about five days, they then form a monolayer uh, with a, with a transepithelial resistance of about 60 ohms centimeter squared, and this is maintained out over 14 days. If we look at the um, barrier function, we can measure the apparent permeability to mannitol, which gives us a measure of, of barrier function. And you can see that it's in the order of about four, um, four to 10 uh, times 10 to the minus six um, centimeters cent per, cent, um, per second. So this actually is, is, is the same in both systems. So that whether you grow your cells statically or with flow, then they form monolayers. So that is a very good first, um, first thing to have. So you can measure transport activity now. The second thing we wanted to do was to show that they actually improved our phenotype. And so this first set of data just shows the expression levels in uh, at the qPCR level. And this is um, six, from six kidneys. And you can see if we look at the key transporters, OAT1, OAT3, OCT2 and the mates, then they're all increased at, um, at the PCR level. The mates and the OCTs go up at over fivefold. Uh, sorry, the OC, o, OATs and OCTs go up fivefold. Mate goes up about fourfold. And then you can see urate transporters, MR, MR, MDR1, MRP and the large uh, medullin and cubulin all go up. So this is at the, is at the protein, uh, sorry, the, the, the message level. Very importantly, OAT1 and OAT3 are often lost in culture. So these are the ones that are very hard to keep in culture. So that's at message level. We can also um, show, the, show some uh, protein expression. So one of the things that, that defines a proximal tubule cell is the expression of a primary cilia. And uh, we can show the primary cilia by staining for two two parts of it. One is the cetylated tubulin in green, and the second is pericentrum in red. So you can see that in our static cultures, 
we do have expression of, 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 of central cilia. You can see the red, you can see the green. But the, if we take our system and induce flow, then if, after uh, several days in flow, you can see that the expression levels of pericentrum and, and, and um, acetylated tubulin go up around about fourfold. So we were able to, using high content imaging, we're able to, to quantify this. So that we are definitely improving the expression of one of the key markers of differentiation, the expression of a primary cilia. What about transporters? Well, transporters are really key, particularly the oats. They are very much lost and are, are really difficult to measure in many real systems. But you can see here, this is oat one under static and under flow. O3 static and underflow, mate static and underflow. And you can see very clearly um, that the blue is dappy, the red is the is the stain for the um for the oat. And you can see very clearly that they increase, uh, there's an increase in expression level. We've started to quantify this, and in initial uh, quantification experiments, we see that the that the uptake, the increase in expression of O81, O83 and mates is around about three to four fold that found in our static cultures. Equally, if you look at the large um, endocytotic um, receptor mediated endocytosis and look for the receptors there, megalin and cubulin, you can see again, very, very good um, upregulation of both megalin and cubulin in our system. So again, these are, regulate, these are upregulated uh, three to four times. So we're really seeing the impact of flow in our system. If we look at function, then if we just concentrate, uh, start with megalin and cubulin, then expression is enhanced and also functions enhanced. So if we look at fits the albumin as a, as a measure of, of, of activity, you can see that it's enhanced several fold um, versus static. So we're really seeing functional improvement in our monolayers as well. If we move to, um, um, to to toxicity, as you know, we 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 published quite a lot on toxicity with with um, and and made sure that we and we published that our model is really predictive of toxicity. If we now compare our static with our flow model, what we see is this is just some data for um, cisplatin exposure. If you look at tear um, exposing cells to increasing levels of cisplatin, re results in a decrease in tear, but it's actually steeper. In, in our um, flow cells, if we look at um, ATP as a measure of cell health, then it decreases in, in if you expose them to cisplatin, but it's steeper in our system. So, so it seems to be more sensitive. And if we look at our biomarkers, KIM1, N-GAL and clustering, then over a concentration range, you can see that the response in our flow system is bigger than and, and, more, and occurs earlier than, than in our static system. So it seems to be that what we see is that in, if we int introduce flow, then we make our system more sensitive to, to damage. What about transport? Here's just one example. I can show you lots and lots of transported data. This is just one example. This is creatinine flux. So what we've again measured is we want to show the, the, the movement of creatinine, both the absorption of creatinine and the secretion, so this is the A to B, the absorption of creatinine and, and, and the static conditions, the secretory flux in the opposite direction is bigger. So you get a net secretion of creatinine across the, across the system. And that's exactly what you see in vivo. But if you do it in our flow system, then the, the, um, the magnitude of, of the fluxes are about two times. So we're really, in, with our system, we really are enhancing the cells. So in this very short presentation, I can only show you key parts of our data. The summary that we've got is this is a high throughput, uh, 24 and 96 well transwell format. All you require to do this is transwells, our MPS filter holder and a rocker. Each rocker will take eight 96 well plates. So the throughput is eight times 96 well. Um, at a minimum, we can get two rockers in, our, in a single incubator. So it's 16 times 96 well um, from a single kidney. The good thing about our approximate model is we have extensive data gathered over eight years showing approximate uh, the, 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 the utility of the approximate model. 
And this year alone, we've been uh, taking part uh, and, and submit being part of eight IND submissions on both transport and uh, toxicity. And the the data show that that the proximate cells outperform um, immortalized cells and predictiveness. Um, when we introduce flow, we see a, a substantial improvement in key proteins at both PCR and protein level versus static. We have a large amount of qualification data in this in this model now, both on transport and nephrotoxicity and for small and large molecules. And then a unique point is that in addition to being able to do this a static and in as flow at high levels, then we can do it in human, dog, rat, mouse and NHP. So we have a, a very low cost basic approach which will be able to transform anyone's um, cells, any cells that you can grow in transvals into um, cells that undergo flow and can be differentiated more for a very, um, for a very reasonable um, outlay. So I'll finish there. Awesome. Thank you so much, Colin. Um, it doesn't look like we have time for questions for you yeah. individually, which is all good, um, but we will save them for the round table. Um, at this point, yeah, you can go ahead and um, turn off your video and microphone and we'll welcome Sevier from Emulate. Well, uh, just uh, hi, everybody. Um, that's a brief introduction. My name is Sauver Gentil. Uh, I'm a principal scientist uh, from Emulate. Um, so at Emulate, we, we focus on developing um, in vitro organ chip models to emulate biology and, and, and better predict uh, human response. So, um, you know, as uh, um, one of the scientists who helped develop this model, uh, I'm very excited to speak to you today about the proximal tubule kidney chip. And really, as uh, some of you, some uh, has been discussed here, uh, and as you know, nephrotoxicity remains a primary side effects of side effect of um, most therapeutics. So this not only affects uh, you know, the on market uh, therapy, but also uh, the drug development pipeline. So what we wanted to do um, at Emulate is really. Uh, given uh, the fact that in animal model is falling Sevier, short. In I'm not sure we see your slides advancing because um, I have a feeling you've been advancing slides and I'm not actually oh. seeing them. OK, no, I, I actually have not. <laughs> Sorry. Thank okay, you. OK, um, so we're not alone. OK, OK, maybe uh, maybe I was getting ahead of myself. <laughs> no, no, no problem. No problem. Uh, thank OK, you. so perfect. Uh, yeah, Sorry guess, about um, that. No, no problem at all. No problem. Uh, thank you for 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 reminding me of that. Um, now I wanted to 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 ju just briefly explain the fact that you know, we focus on developing a model uh, that provide an in vivo relevant microenvironment that would you know help and and becoming a better tool uh, to predict uh, clinical outcomes. So you know, to your point here, uh, this is just a brief um, a summary of the key features of the proximal tubule chip. So this model. It's probably uh, one of the unique model out there in the sense that it's a primary core culture uh, using uh, kidney proximal tubule epithelial cells and, and, and renal microvascular endothelial cells um, recreating the proximal tubule interface um, in a what we'd call, um, if we could use this term, a more organotypic uh, manner. Um, so we'll show that the model uh, maintain morphology and function for at least 14 days. Uh, but we will also uh, show you that, and has has been shown here, that the, this chip maintain and show a superior a cytoarchitecture um, and, and polarization markers due to the introduction of, of fluidic shear stress, as well as as um, improve uh, transporter function uh, compared to transwell. Uh, and lastly, um, we will discuss the fact that this model can be used for multiple functions, including applications, including uh, toxicity as drug-drug interaction and a multiple uh, other applications that we will not have time to discuss here. This is a brief um, overview of the model. Um, as you can see uh, you, in this schematic, uh, this cross section here uh, shows that the model is composed of two, uh, the chip is composed of two channels. Uh, a top and a bottom channel. So the proximal tubule epithelial cells are cultured 
uh, on the top channel with the bottom channel line uh, with renal microvascular. So both primary cells cre recreating the proximal tubule uh, and peritubular capillary interface. So this video here uh, depict the epithelial endothelial interface as we, we, we described, uh, seeing the, uh, the epithelium stand positive um, for the tight junction protein marker Z01 and the endothelium here uh, standing positive for uh, the adherent junction protein V adherent. So before we uh, could dive into the data related to uh, the functionality of the chip, I'd like to show you this is a, a, a typical study design really to get a sense of how uh, the data was generated from the chip. Uh, briefly, we uh, we coat the membrane of the chips using uh, a specific extracellular matrix composition um, to closely reflect the tubular basement membrane. Um, after one day, uh, we culture both cell types on the chip, and after initial attachment of the cells, um, we connect all chips on flow and allow the cells to stabilize and remodel for uh, up to seven days. At this point, uh, you can uh, start with compound treatment of interest or perform functional assessment, um, including morphological assessment um, for uh, look, using a tight junction protein. Uh, we could also assess um, you know, cell-specific markers for both cell type. Um, and more importantly, we can assess kidney-specific transporters as well as their function. So in developing uh, the chip, so we, we have multiple ways of characterizing the cells. And, and one of the ways is really confirming, assessing the formation of the monolayer in the chip. And it, you know, the, this chip is clear uh, and flexible, so it can be taken under the microscope uh, to look at morphology using bright field, as is shown here by this montage. Um, but also, you know, it can be used for immunostaining, um, as is shown here, uh, confirming monolayer formation. But additionally, we look at um, the expression of key uh, functional um, and polarization markers, such as uh, sodium potassium ATPase, acropo one um, you know, as well as you know, kidney-specific characteristic, such as primary cilia formation. But um, as was mentioned right before me, uh, fluidic shear stress is very, in fact, extremely important for proper functional uh, function um, and polarization of proximal tubule epithelial cells. So here we have clearly established that um, when we when flow is into, in, introduced, um, the, the the cells uh, show a superior uh, pol uh, polarization, um, as is shown here with increased expression of uh, key functional markers here, uh, so jump potassium ATPase, tacroporin, as well as better characteristic of the cells when you compare to a static uh, culture. In fact, uh, transcriptomic analysis of the epithelial cells in the, uh, uh, from the chip conf uh, confirmed that key uh, transporters um, are expressed, uh, in fact, has significantly higher um, transcriptional expression compared to transwell. Um, and, and for example, if you look, if you look at the cubulin and megalin, um, and as well as some of the solute carrier uh, molecule that, has, they, that were mentioned earlier, um, and, it, it, you know, in vivo, as was discussed here as well, uh, megalin and cubulin couples to, uh, to mediate albumin reabsorption. So beyond gene expression, uh, we were able to, uh, to confirm um, protein level of megalin using West, Western blood, as well as immunostaining analysis. Um, so, you know, it... It means really nothing to have these transporters expressed in your system, system if they don't uh, perform. So interestingly, we're able to also confirm that, um, uh, and this is here representative data, that megalin expression correlated very well with albumin uh, reabsorption, um, So we, which was captured here is in uh, albumin, human albumin conjugated to FITSI. Uh, but you know, another key function of proximal tubule is really the ability to clear a xenobiotic um, from our system. 
Um, so, you know, it, though we show the expression of uh, these solute transporter carriers here, um, we, we, are, we, we went further that show that they are functional uh, by, you know, assessing uh, efflux or clearance of, of substrates. And, and what we're able to show is that these cells in the chip perform much better in clearing um, this substrate compared to Transwell, uh, exhibiting a significant increase in efflux ratio. Now, you know, this, this model um, can be used, as I stated earlier, for multiple ap applications across drug discovery and development, um, including um, toxicity testing. So what I wanted to do um, today is to show you some of the key data uh, generated in establishing this model um, for mechanistic and general toxicity assessment. So we, we first tested um, the, the chip we're using a gentamicin. Uh, gentamicin, as you know, is, is, a, is a, one of the aminoglycosides, uh, an antibiotic, uh, but it is known to cause, um, sorry, an antibiotic. It is known to cause um, uh, kidney uh, toxicity at high concentration. Uh, so what we did in the chip, we, we, we expose uh, the proximal tubule epithelial cells uh, with a clinically relevant concentration of gentamicin. And here you are able to see that at the highest concentration, uh, you started to see um, the, the generation or loss of, 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 of the co typical cobblestone morphology of the cells. But gentamicin also in the chip um, cause cytotoxicity and cell death. As, as we show here, uh, with an increase um, um, an increase in caspase 3, uh, indicating some level of uh, uh, epoptotic activity, uh, as well as um, increasing LDH over time at the highest concentration, indica indicating uh, that there, um, there's cellular damage or necrosis happening. We were further demonstrated that gentamicin in, in, induced a, uh, <clears throat> a concentration-dependent increase in reactive oxygen species a, a, with concomitant reduction in, in ALB, really suggesting some level of um, oxidative stress as well as alteration in, in key cellular function. Um, but we also uh, tested the chip uh, using uh, cisplatin. So cisplatin is actually a very good chemotherapeutic um, drug, but uh, its clinical usefulness is limited because of non nephrotoxicity um, So we exposed the, the cells to for 24 hours uh, with uh, a range of cisplatin concentration up to 100 fold. And after seven days, uh, you, you could see that um, cisplatin induce a concentration dependent loss in the cellular architecture, as is captured here by loss of the cell uh, polarization, loss of morphology, and, 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 and complete distraction. We also observe a reduc reduction in mitochondrial function. But I think what was more important in this study uh, is that uh, total protein quantification seems to indicate that this damage is happening in a clinically relevant manner. Uh, uh, generating an IC50 of 13 micromolar, which is well within the reported um, clinical CMAX for cisplatin. More interestingly, um, so cisplatin, in fact, uh, did um, induce uh, some level of uh, cytotoxicity as is captured by um, LDH release. But it, 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 it does so in a concentration uh, dependent, a time and concentration, concentration dependent manner. So it is worth um, noticing that this is really kind of um, showing the level of sensitivity of this model because um, every, all of us in this field understand that cisplatin in vitro is a sledgehammer. So you either use a, a small concentration, get no response, or you have to use a huge concentration and you destroy all of the cells and get no response. So it was really nice to see this level of sensitivity um, um, with the LDH release 
But I think more interestingly was the increase in Kim one and VEGFA, as well as the um, the, the pro-inflammatory cytokines here, IL-6 and the, and the chemokine MCP1, which happens as early as uh, six hours post-treatment. And, and more interestingly, it continues 168 hours, so seven days later uh, for the kidney injury, injuries, uh, injury markers, and, and, and 22 hours for the inflammatory cytokines. So lastly, um, we, we were able to show uh, as well, and as is known, that this plant induced um, some level of apoptotic um, with increase in caspase and a reduction in ALP activity, uh, which indicates uh, you know, as well that there was an alteration in the cellular function. I guess to recap, um, so what we've been, what we, we've discussed so far, is that this this is a, a primary um, cool culture model using uh, kidney specific cells. Sorry, using kidney specific cells uh, in an organotypic manner, um, and we've shown that the model, uh, the cells in the in the chip, are able to maintain morphology and function for for at least 14 days, um, and we've shown we've shown the importance of uh, fluidic shear stress in allowing the cells to remodel and, and exhibiting superior uh, cytoarchitecture and polarization compared to cells in transwell, as well as improve uh, uh, transport expression and function. We discussed the fact that the model could be, can be used for multiple applications. So we've shown you so far that it can be used for uh, toxicity testing, but um, the model can also be used for um, uh, drug-drug interaction, uh, in fact, talking about speaking about drug drug interaction, uh, we do have a publication currently available um, on the uh, bioarchive in a in a work uh, collaboration that was done with Covent. Um, other example really is the the work being done at the at Duke University by Dr. Musa in her lab, where they've they've used this platform to create um, a, a glomerulus wall on a chip as well as, I believe, an isogenic proximal tubule model um, using iPS-derived cells. Um, and lastly, uh, you know, I've been using this uh, with multiple uh, clients where we use it for different application, including assessing fibrosis um, and, um, and uh, compound reabsorption as well. Uh, looks like I went slightly over time, but I, I want to thank you all for uh, your attention and for listening. So we'll take the questions uh, in the round table. Thanks everyone. Apologies for tech difficulties on my side. Um, I'm Elsa Vidula from Draper. I lead the kidney programs here within our biomedical engineering division. Um, my contact information is on this title slide as well as Tim Petrie, the program manager. And I do want a, a quick shout out to Aaron Shaughnessy and Sam Khan, both Draper scholars and PhD candidates who are um, have done the bulk of the work that I'll be presenting today. Next slide. Uh, so pr our, our, uh, our MPS system, PREDICT96, um, is based on a microfluidic cell culture platform. It, it contains 96 microfluidic bilayer devices, uh, two channels separated by a semi-permeable membrane. Cells can go on top or bottom channel or both. Um, and we have user-controlled fluid flow in each of those channels and top and bottom. That fluid flow is controlled by a custom pumping lid. Uh, and uh, Megan, you can go ahead and animate through all the slides initially. Um, and, and that custom pump lid delivers fluid flow uh, to top channels and bottom channels uh, with a pneumatically driven uh, micro pumps. There are 192 micro pumps within this custom lid, uh, uh, allowing a flow to every single top channel and bottom channel in the P96 system. Uh, that flow is delivered to the channels by um, recirculating the fluid flow within the microfluidic channels uh, by bringing fluid up a what we call a sipper from one port of a microfluidic channel to another. Those sippers also serve as electrodes. And so the um, each of these 96 microfluidic devices within the cell culture platform also have the ability to be evaluated um, with tier. And so that's a four point probe measurement tier system in each of these devices, which enables uh, measurements within culture conditions, stable heat, humidity, pH, et cetera. Next slide. Uh, another sensor we have integrated within the P96 system is oxygen sensing. 
Um, and the oxygen sensors are placed in the bottom channel. It is a photosensitive film, um, and, and oxygen concentration is detected with a fiber optic uh, uh, detector underneath. Um, sequential alignment of this detector enables measurement under fluid flow conditions um, in near real time in the P96 system. Next slide. The, um, so jumping into, so what, what our uh, renal proximal tubule model, the P96 system has been most extensively characterized um, in uh, the renal proximal tubule in P96. Uh, we culture human primary epithelial cells and human microvascular endothelial cells uh, in the system on each side of the permeable membrane, forming that full reabsorptive barrier, nice coverage of each of those cell types on either side of the membrane, um, forming that full reabsorptive barrier in the system. Nice expression of markers. I'll get more into that. Celia, so we care a lot about flow. Go ahead. That was that was correct. Thanks, Megan. <laughs> the, um, we care a lot about flow. We can control it. It's unidirectional in each of these channels. So we look a lot at how the expression of these markers uh, respond to things like fluid flow and see nice cilia being one of those, uh, of course, um, and see nice uh, significant changes in expression of those cilia under flow compared to static conditions um, and also compared to various and injured conditions. Uh, relevant diseases to cilia expression and fluid flow, like polycystic kidney, kidney disease, um, uh, are relevant models here. We've looked at uh, expression from the um, PC1 gene uh, co-localized with the, the aciliated tubule in there and those pictures on the bottom right. Next slide. We've looked at other expressions of transporters and markers in the proximal tubule in P96, including um, sodium potassium ATPase pumps, sodium hy hydrogen exchangers three, and uh, uh, because of the, our ability to screen culture parameters in our system, it's easy to look at how the expression of those changes under different regimes of fluid flow, whether it's applied on the top or the bottom, uh, low or high, and see nice uh, changes in that structure depending on the culture conditions um, and nice polarization of the tissue accordingly. Next slide. Structure uh, and expression is usually our first step in characterizing tissue. Then we look at function, transport function in particular across uh, the proximal tubule reabsorptive barrier. And um, a couple examples here, glucose reabsorption being one through the FGLT2 transporter, nice expression of that, uh, and also transport of uh, substrates through the OAT transporter, uh, OAT transporters, nice expression of those as well. Typically, these um, the evaluation of this transport is done in a way where we can modulate the transport so that we can ensure that the, the that function is being dictated by the tissue itself and not the membrane characteristics, for example. Uh, and that's what some of these graphs show is, is a change when we directly inhibit the transporters involved in that function. Next slide. And so the goal of, of um, the slides today is to delve a little deeper into these readouts, the tear and the oxygen. And I'll do that by going into a couple of examples, uh, mainly uh, cisplatin toxicity, um, ischemic reperfusion, also for the oxygen sensors, um, how, how those are integrated into our system and change as, as we modulate metabolic activity of the proximal tubule model, um, and how that's related to some of the injury models. Next slide. So uh, going into tier and um, characterizing tier in our system and our prox uh, primary proximal tubule cells, uh, the, physiologically, the proximal tubule is uh, relatively leaky. Uh, tear is relatively low compared to other barrier tissues in the body. body. This makes tear somewhat challenging for, for um, a readout in primary tissue. Uh, so we see a pretty consistent um, increase in tear over time to a plateau. Uh, in our system um, in the, the high throughput P96, and, and this is the co-culture reabsorptive barrier function, and this consistent um, uh, barrier evaluation and trend uh, serves a nice baseline and benchmarking for the injury and toxicity models going forward. You can animate through this slide. For, um, so cisplatin toxicity, uh, the main goal of this evaluation is, is not necessarily to show that our tissue is sensitive to cisplatin toxicity, but more to characterize and evaluate um, the high throughput tier readout of our system 
in the, the primary PT model uh, with uh, cisplatin as a injury marker, an uh, injury trigger. And so on the left, the, um, Im the fluorescent images show uh, obvious destruction of the barrier uh, via the one expression, and that's nicely correlated in the plot in the middle to tier express uh, to, to change in tier. So each of those individual data points uh, represents um, uh, a, a, a device within a range of three cisplatin treatments. Um, and, and we see that tissue with fewer tight junctions quantified on the y-axis uh, correlate uh, significantly with uh, reductions in tier as expected. Um, and then the interesting thing here is that when compared to standard uh, uh, injury or toxicity readouts like LDH, how, how does tier measure up against that uh, in this um, high-scaled high system? Um, within 24 hours of a cisplatin exposure, uh, there's, uh, we did not find a significant uh, release of LDH, uh, but over that same time frame, we did see a significant reduction in tier um, at this dose in the system, which speaks to um, an earlier time point revealed by tier and perhaps a higher sensitivity of tier uh, to things like cisplatin. Next slide. Uh, jumping into the oxygen sensing a little bit and how that uh, can be leveraged for a multi-parametric readout of, of the proximal tubule model in PREDICT-96. Uh, like I mentioned, the sensor exists in that bottom channel, and you can do this kind of rastering detection of the oxygen concentration in that system, map it to a plate map. Um, and we, we, know, we see through this evaluation that the oxygen concentration in the channel is dependent on two main things the fluid flow in that channel and the consumption of the cells that live in that channel. And so we can control it. The plate itself is made out of a non-permeable material, which makes it easy for us to um, control the oxygen levels and measure it at the same time. So when cells are present in the channel, we uh, note a consumption of oxygen when the pumps are turned off, that's that middle bottom, and a return of that oxygen concentration when the pumps are turned back on. So fluid flow is delivering oxygen to the system. When fluid flow is not delivering oxygen to the system, the consumption drives it down, um, uh, down the oxygen levels. The plot on the right there is showing increased consumption over time during a culture window uh, as cells are proliferating and, and forming monolayers. Also another bench line for um, upcoming injury and, and disease models in the system. Next slide. Another way to validate these sensors and their ability to characterize oxygen consumption in the system is to uh, modulate the metabolic activity of the proximal tubule tissue. And we can do that by um, different uh, drugs that are known to increase metabolic activity. And what we see is that uh, by increasing metabolic activity, we see an increase in oxygen consumption um, of oxygen, oxygen consumption compared to controls, and likewise a reduction of that consumption when we inhibit um, or decrease metabolic activity with known drugs in the system. Next slide. And so that's tied to another injury model that we can model, uh, um, evaluate ischemic reperfusion injury. Uh, again, we can control this oxygen concentration nicely in the channels uh, across the plate. Uh, the bottom left plot there is showing uh, that immediate reduction of oxygen concentration after the pumps are turned off and maintained at that less than 1% oxygen saturation for several hours. We've done additional measurements that show that that can be maintained for 24 hours or longer, uh, even throughout a media change, which um, causes a, a, just a blip over a couple hours before returning to ischemic conditions, hypoxic conditions. Um, and then turning that back on, of course, uh, simulates that reperfusion side of this injury model. The plate and the ability to control flow allows us to do the ischemic injury on the same plate as continuous flow control. Uh, and then we can measure tear all at the same time to uh, understand how barrier function might be a relevant readout to an injury like this. Uh, we've seen some interesting results from this, um, increase in barrier function when ischemia is introduced, so hypoxic over a day or two, and then immediate uh, reduction of that barri barrier function when reperfusion is turned back on. Next slide. Uh, animation. Um, and similar, you know, what does this look like at, at the plot level here? Um, and the time scale, the, the, one of the beauties of the high throughput tier uh, custom lid is that um, within a few hours, you can, you can read all 96 wells 
um, or you, you can do that more uh, frequently, but uh, early time points with tear allow you to see changes in bar barrier function um, soon after introducing injury, for example. So we see an increase here, like I mentioned, but that's just three hours uh, after turning off the flow. Um, and then three hours after reperfusion, turning off the pumps a couple days later, we see that um, immediate uh, decrease in tear again, highlighting uh, that uh, the useful time scale of a of a near real time tier readout here. The snapshot of the plate, each of these little mini plots here represent a device on the PREDICT 96 system. Um, and it's a nice look at the high throughput long term tracking uh, that tier allows um, in P96. Uh, this particular plate was, went through an ischemic reperfusion injury cycle, several cycles, the left half there, you can see uh, characteristic changes in tier uh, at the replicate level resolution compared to the right half of the plate with continuous flow. Um, the entire plate can be read in under eight minutes um, under its culture conditions. Main conclusions and especially impact, uh, this system with integrated tier and auction sensing uh, has, has been able to capture dynamic responses of our tissue under various injury models, um, whether it's toxicity or ischemic reperfusion injury, um, suggesting that tier is a, a valuable uh, uh, readout at, in this advanced um, culture platform at scale. Um, I, I mentioned the rapid and scalable tier under eight minutes for all 96 replicates. And uh, this, what this all means is that it's really amenable for combinatorial screening, uh, whether it's for culture conditions, flow, seeding densities, establishing a new model, compound screening in an already established model, injury mechanism screening, uh, how does your tissue respond to different injuries, how do they recover from those injuries in the presence of compounds, um, all under different culture conditions, uh, if that makes sense. And I believe, oh, uh, very recent publications in our kidney model in P96, highlighting three of those there, also as a way to just acknowledge uh, the folks that have worked on this, not only from the P96 side, but the oxygen model side. I mentioned Aaron Shaughnessy and Sam Kahn, first authors on those first two papers, um, and have several papers in preparation in the next few months here, um, going more into oxygen measurements and, tox and a toxicity model, um, more ischemic reperfusion injury data, and then a, and a thorough characterization of tear uh, while pumping under um, a range of barrier functions. With that, I'd like to thank everyone. We'll take questions now or in the chat or later in the work workshop. That's it. Thank you. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Elsa, for sticking with us even through <laughs> some technical difficulties. I, I appreciate the help there. <laughs> Yes, always, uh, you know, exciting doing a virtual workshop. Um, now, um, I believe last but not least, we'll call on Stepan from Nordis to present. Uh, so thank you all for uh, joining today and um, watching my talk and the uh, rest of the speakers on the kidney MPS uh, workshop we're having. Um, so my name is Stepan Bafti. I'm the director of biological sciences at Nordis and uh, we are a organ on chip company based out of Seattle, Washington. So I'm going to jump right into what our technology does and particularly what our human kidney chip, uh, the characteristics that make it unique. So uh, as you can see here, we have a disposable microfluidic chip, which has three different chambers. Each one of these chambers has an individual uh, tubule of epithelial cells, and these are renal proximal tubule epithelial cells. Um, one of the core um, parts of our technology that makes us unique is the ability to cast collagen gels around a thin glass mandrel that's uh, set in place during the manufacturing process of these chips. So when we um, get these chips out of manufacturing, we put these collagen uh, matrices around this thin mandrel and then extract this mandrel, which leaves this hollow scaffold. And as you can see, we can form these tubular tissue structures that are not coming in contact with anything other than the extracellular matrix. So these cells are not interfacing with any inorganic material at any time, any membranes or anything like that. Um, and they are under continuous perfusion, which gives them the characteristics uh, that we will take a look at, uh, giving them in vivo resembling protein expression, things like that. 
So these chips, I should also mention, are um, offered as pre-seeded chips. So we fully formed the tissues in-house and shipped them um, all over the country and uh, soon uh, to the rest of the world as well. Uh, so there's no need to even know how to do cell culture when you're purchasing these chips from us. So you just need to know how to plug them into their um, culture modules, which I will outline here. So these are the other components of the technology. Each chip is plugged into a culture module that holds source and collection reservoirs. And we have a different selection of chips that depending on what kind of applications we're interested in doing, we, um, we can use uh, various types of chip designs. So each one of these culture modules is placed into a docking station that uh, goes into a standard cell culture incubator. And you can fit up to 144 independent experiments in a, a single incubator um, if you're using our highest form factor chip, which is the, currently the triple channel chip, uh, and you fill up uh, multiple docking stations. And then the perfusion for all of these chips is driven by pneumatic pressure. Um, through a gas pump that sits on the outside of the um, incubator. Okay, so in our tissue microenvironments, in these tubular tissues that we're casting in our um, devices, we have strict compartments, basolateral and luminal compartments, and we can deliver drugs depending on what type of chip design we use, both luminally and basolaterally. So we can really um, distinguish these strict compartments well in our chip. Um, and, you know, our kidney chip expresses primary cilia um, where, you know, we also have this nice ability to, to do imaging with high resolution in our chips because of a 1.5 cover glass that sits at the bottom of the chip um, where you can place the chip on an inverted microscope and do imaging um, without having to um, have the challenges that you would through PDMS or anything like that. So we can get very high resolution images with our chips. Um, most people here uh, are, are probably well familiar with the um, relevance of the uh, proximal tubule and the um, transporter repertoire that it has on its basolateral and apical compartments that give rise to its functionality. So this idea that the, the transporters not only have to be present in you know, quantities that are uh, useful, but in, they have to be in the right places. And the you know our chip having no uh, inorganic um, surfaces touching the tissue and being continuously perfused really allows the cells to uh, sort of bring their uh, more in vivo resembling phenotypic um, characteristics out and that's uh, reflected in this slide here so on the left column we have human kidney uh, tissue sections that were stained with antibodies against sodium potassium ATPase, megalin O1, and SGLT2. These are all key transporters that you're all familiar with. Um, and if you notice in the, in the middle column, we have a section through the, the optical section through the middle of the proximal tubule chip. And you can notice that the expression of these uh, proteins are and transporters are uh, extremely similar to that what we see in the human uh, in vivo tissue sections. Um, for example, if we look at megalum, where we see intense um, signal on the brush border, um, and, and in our chip, we see the same thing. And if you notice on the basal lateral surface, these nuclei are kind of sitting on the outside of this tube, indicating that this is a truly apical stain. Um, and we see similar patterning, for example, in L1 tissue sections that we do with the chip as well. So we're able to recapitulate the expression patterns that we see in vivo in the chip. So our chip also has other unique features like the ability to do live imaging under perfusion. Um, and, the, and this can be really useful for uh, certain types of assays that we use live imaging experiments for. Um, and the barrier permeability assay is one of our key uh, assays that we use perfuse live imaging for. So we're imaging by perfusing dyes of a known molecular weight through the lumen of the tubule. And then we're measuring the bleed out of this uh, dye into the matrix. And we know the weight of the molecule and we're able to use an equation to um, determine what the permeability of that particular vessel is um, using something called the Patlack plot. And we have um, software that we're working on now with a, a company that develops the software for us um, that will automatically um, give us the results, the readouts of each one of these assays. So 
it's uh, it's pretty um, it's a pretty robust way of and physiological way of measuring your permeability as opposed to something like tear. And we've shown that you can track the maturation of the barrier of the kidney chip um, over a number of days, and this has actually become part of our preceded chip um, quality assessment. We now, um, before we ship chips out the door, are able to do barrier assessments on random. Uh, chips from a batch that are going to be sent out and just determine whether the barrier is within the range that we uh, typically see it being. And this is just for one molecular weight, but we would typically do this for two. Um, but as you can see, the barrier sort of has this um, maturation stage where there's a, quite a bit of variability within the first week that starts to tighten up toward uh, the second and beyond. Um, and this slide is basically showing that if we take, um, if we track the permeability of these tubes individually from individual chips over time, um, that first week variability can be noticed uh, when we look at the differences between these different lines, but uh, ultimately they all converge on the same place past the first week and continue to become tighter. And um, no matter how many times we dose the chips with the uh, dyes for the barrier, they seem to be fine. So you can do repeated barrier assays on these chips. Um, and in the case of transporter assays, similar to our barrier assay, we're using essentially the same techniques where we're doing live imaging under perfusion. Um, but we are using something like a glucose analog in this case to measure the functionality of the glucose transporters. Um, so we are perfusing this over time, and if the proximal tubule cells are doing what they are supposed to be doing in the presence of glucose, they will uh, absorb it as it comes through. So you might recall that when I showed you the previous video of the permeability assay um, with fluorescein perfusing through this tube, you saw a bleed out of the fluorescein into the collagen. This molecule, 2-MBDG, is actually 0.02 kD smaller than fluorescein. So um, it, it should, in theory, if this was just a passive diffusive tube, uh, diffuse even more than the fluorescein. But instead, we're seeing a functional um, transport of the glucose into the cells that you can assess post-wash at. And recently, a company called Dejindo has offered a red version of this glucose uptake assay as well, which is nice if you're trying to double up your assays with various colors and fluorescent molecules. So this is just to distinguish between the passive and active transport that I've uh, just described. Um, we're also able to do viability assays where we look at the entire length of the tube and are able to count the number of cells and uh, normalize to the number of cells based off of how many live and dead cells we have. And this is something we're currently working on, but this will become extremely useful for cases where you have drug exposures to tubes and you not only have a large number of dead cells, but cells have now left the system. You know, it's akin to a necrosis situation in vivo, perhaps, where um, cells start to slough off of these tubes. And um, that way you have a better metric of um, how much viability there truly is compared to a lack of signal from live or dead from missing cells. Okay, and just to touch on one other uh, live imaging uh, experiment that we're um, going to soon uh, work on releasing as an application, um, live calcium imaging under perfusion, where by dialing in the um, amount of shear stress um, during the experiment, so we, we were imaging live for a number uh, for a given time, and during this imaging session, I was just turning the flow rate and and thus the shear stress. Um, uh, up and down just to see if we can get a response. And as you can see, using wide field microscopy, we can. Okay, uh, this is just a quick schematic of how we would do a workflow for comparison of 2D versus 3D responsive to nephrotoxins. Um, and basically here we're looking at LDH measurements from polymyxin treated 2D plates and our chips in 3D here. And as you'll notice in 2D, no matter, and these are different days uh, in culture where this was assessed at 24 hours, um, there is a continuing rise in nephrotoxicity to unphysiologically high levels in 2D, where you see this nice rise and fall in our 3D chips. Um, and we can actually measure um, uh, other biomarkers, for example, in the case of Chem1 here, 
Uh, we're seeing its rise and fall in our chip that kind of matches up with the LDH response. And if we look back at some in vivo rat data from uh, Vaidya et, et, et al, where we are able to see treatment with nephrotoxins that relate to these various stages of necrosis, or so the sliding scale of histopathology from mildly damaged to very damaged, we can kind of replicate that in our chips as well by looking, matching up the correlating the viability to the biomarker responses. Um, and then our chip has also been used to look at antisensitive ligand nucleotide nephrotoxicity in a case where preclinical uh, data looked fine, but in early phase one clinical trials, things didn't look so good. Um, and so this group from AstraZeneca has a was able to recapitulate this nephrotoxicity uh, in our chips. Um, and here is some of the data from that paper where we're looking at elevated LDH um, in response to polymyxin, as I've just shown in our previous data, uh, but also these were uh, perfused continuously and dosed continuously for 20 days, and you can delineate the differences between nephrotoxic and non-nephrotoxic ASOs in the chip. And as you can see here, NGAL had a particularly large response, but I'm going to blast forward because I'm running out of time. Um, so basolaterally deli uh, basolateral delivering the uh, chip is something that we're also able to do, um, where again, a group from AstraZeneca, different paper. Um, showed that you can have stable drug delivery and stable concentration over a long period of time by basolaterally or luminally delivering uh, drugs, in this case, cisplatin. Um, and finally, this is a um, new paper from uh, a, a group in AstraZeneca where they look at um, megalin in this particular figure in our chips. So in 2D, as you can see, megalin is not expressed very well, but in our chips, um, you can see a nice brush border expression um, and and not so much on the basolateral surface indicating that it is in the right place that it should be. And here's just a reminder from our tissue section in vivo what it looks like in the actual human tissue section. And that looks pretty close to what we're getting in the chip. And the gene expression levels, um, according to the study, are also elevated significantly compared to um, 2D cultures. Okay, before I end, I always have to touch on something a little bit fun and um, uh, uh, something from our collaborators at University of Washington who have sent our chips to space multiple times now. And in this particular case for the um, um, formation of kidney stones as uh, metabolism speeds up in micro um, gravity environments. So basically calcium oxalate uh, crystal formation is something that is uh, more amenable to microgravity than it is on earth. Um, and so here's a uh, video of our uh, chips in a special casing made by this company called BioServe on the International Space Station. And that's just something I always like to show because I mean, it's fun, so why not? Okay, here are some of our um, cu customers, collaborators that we continue to work with, uh, just a subset. Uh, but we serve pharmaceutical bio biotechnology industry as well as academic researchers. So um, we kind of uh, have a solution for everyone. Okay, and uh, I believe uh, that's all I have for today. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Safand. If you want to go ahead and stop sharing. And um, at this point, that was the final presentation for today. Um, so we're actually going to jump into the roundtable Q&A. So I'll go ahead and ask um, all of the presenters for today um, to go ahead and um, turn on their cameras, and then I will start um, fielding questions. Um, I'll ask you to just um, unmute whenever you're answering. So let me start. Um, let me start with a question, I believe, for Sipond. Um, so the question is, I like the comparison between LDH and tier. Do you always see this level of variability in your tier measurement? And have you ex assessed the effect of cell growth on tier level? Okay, so first of all, we are, our barrier permeability assessment isn't necessarily tier. It's uh, sort of a... Um, uh, our own way of doing it where we're perfusing through the tube as I showed and we're just measuring using the pat like um, method the um, um, uh, bleed out of the dye into the mix surrounding matrix um, can you just remind me what the question was again sorry yes yeah, so the the full question um, I like the comparison between LDH and tier do you always see this level of variability in your tier measurement and have you assessed the effect of cell growth on tier level 
Um, so, uh, yeah, we do see that level of um, uh, variability at the in the maturation of our tubes um, at, within the first week, and that's just because the, there isn't a full cell tube there. There is a, a maturing and dividing situation where we're, we get to about a confluent monolayer of the tissue within a week, um, and so that's sort of what gives rise to this uh, variability. Awesome. Um, and then I was also informed in the chat that that was, I think, also meant to be for um, Elsa for Draper. Um, so, here. yes. So Elsa, yeah, I, I can jump then? in there, and I'll I'll try to rejoin so my video works for some reason. But um, I assume you can hear me now. The yeah. uh, So the question was about the the variability of of the tier. Yes. Um. So. You know, we we do see some variability between experiments, between donor, not experiments, but donors, um, the, the type of membrane we use, uh, the baseline uh, overall is, um, you know, be around 15, sometimes we get up to 20, uh, but our, our, our device to device variability um, is pretty consistent uh, as demonstrated by those error bars and perhaps the plot that you're referencing um, compared to LDH. Awesome, thank you. Um, and then they asked, have you assessed the effect of cell growth on tier level? Yes, yes we have. Um, yeah, we, we do have similar plots that cor that correlate tier level to confluency. Um, and that does of co course depend on um, uh, uh, membrane um, porosity levels uh, as well as um, you know, time time to growth, but it's similar, you know, as but but there is a, a nice correlation there between uh, we, we see it also when we lose confluency uh, after injury. So if we're losing cells because of toxicity response, um, we characterize uh, that density change uh, and it correlates with uh, a decreasing tier as well. Awesome, thank you. Do any of the other presenters want to jump in and answer this question? Um, I always just like to offer it. <laughs> Can I make a, a general comment about tier as a measurement? Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's, there's two two problems with tier just as a measurement. One is there's not a really good, the correlation between tier and permeability isn't linear. It's hyperbolic. So that when, when tier drops below a certain level, then you see very big changes in permeability. But then in another band, the, the tier changes in tier are, are associated with very small changes in permeability, which doesn't make it a very easy um, measure. And then secondly, there's a recent publication um, which showed when they, when they looked at 36 compounds using tier as one of the measurements of toxicity, then it was only 20, 23% predictive of kidney, kidney injury. And so actually it wasn't a very good measure that compared to biomarkers, which were 93%. <laughs> So, so tier is is easy to measure, but I think it's sometimes difficult to interpret because you can see, I mean, we, we certainly with with some molecules, we don't see any changes in tier, but we see quite marked changes in biomarkers. Yeah, I want to, yeah. can I oh. step in, Megan, yeah. as well? Yeah, yeah, go ahead, James. Yeah, so, I mean, I agree with that. I mean, for BBB, GI tract, tier is a really good measurement, um, you know, but kidney values are so low, so low, it's tough. Now we have seen if we take them out for like 20 days or something, the tier values will get higher. Uh, we assume that's better barrier integrity over time. But you know, there's a cost associated with that, makes it difficult. Um, but yeah, tier because it's just so low, it's it's hard to get it above the baseline um, because you know you're measuring values of 10 to 15, which that's generally your noise in in most of your systems. And so if you get a really nice, quiet system, you can kind of see it. But I agree with the, the uh, with Colin in that, you know, that one for kidney is probably not the best. The transporters activity that we have found to be a much better indicator, OK, than tier. Thank yeah. you. So here, did you want to jump in? I could jump in real quick. So. Yeah, so if you're uh, in, then I'll go back to Allison. Yeah, okay. thank you. I was the one who actually asked the question. Um, and part of my concern is really uh, the, the fact that the, the correlation between cell proliferation or, or monolayer that um, that was mentioned, it, it makes it really hard to establish a baseline. 
because you know in culture you do have the cells do proliferate to some extent um, how do you establish you know baseline when you try to compare uh, from you know your uh, injured injured condition between different experiments I think it becomes a very uh, there are some you know confounding factors eventually involved in it interpreting the data yeah I'd love to hear again from Elsa yeah, thank you. Um, I appreciate all of those comments, Colin. Um, I hear you on their first point there about the uh, permeability not being directly cor uh, uh, correlated with tear, and, and that's very true. Um, and also, uh, we we have experienced the, the struggle of that low tear um, with proximal tubule uh, epithelial cells. They are supposed to be low baseline level. And um, I think what we have uh, demonstrated with the PREDICT-96 tier system uh, is its degree of sensitivity um, because it is integrated, because it can be measured without touching the plate. Um, and and was sort of the, the purpose of a lot of that evaluation was to see, can we overcome sort of those challenges of using um, a low baseline tier and uh, validating that against other uh, readouts of, of um, either injury or barrier performance. And so I, I would argue that um, with the right sense, uh, system, that is sensitive, um, high throughput, so you can you can collect you can actually collect, you know, 10 to 30 readings per chip um, within uh, a few seconds sampling rate and average those over and then um, calculate the sensitivity of those readings. Um, then you you can use tier as a complementary readout of injury and toxicity. So especially with a system where you can analyze gene expression, protein expression, direct quantification of transport. Bio, biomarker expression um, and release, uh, it becomes a very informative tool um, in organ on chip platform. Yeah, I, one, one last comment on that. I agree with you 100% for acute single measurement um, systems. Anything where you're going to do multiple measurements, chronic or something else like that, you know, as uh, Samyar, I um, hope I said your name right, Samyar said, you know, it's really hard to reestablish your baseline, you know, um, after you've been, if you're trying to do repeat measurements. But you're right, actually, if you have a lot of different measurements all at the same time, it's an acute short term. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. Awesome. Thank you. Um, the next question is for Colin, although um, I think some of the others um, that have the well plates could answer. Um, I was wondering if all the wells in the plate are connected or if they're divided in groups, i.e. can we measure, can we include multiple conditions such as different types of medium per plate? So Colin, go ahead. Absolutely. Um, I, I apologize that I'm in shadow. It's, it's, it's nighttime here <laughs> and so the light's gone. Um, yes, we can. As, as you remember in my first slide, each of our wells is, is individually perfused. So each of the 96 wells can have a different condition. And the same on our 24 well. So every single, so you can do groups of three. For example, if you want to use a compound, you can do three wells at one concentration, the next three wells at another concentrations, et cetera. Yes, so every, every well is individually perfused, both in our 24 and 96 well plate. That was awesome. the aim, that was the aim to get this high throughput. Great. Um, do any of the others that have um, well systems want to comment on what their systems can do? Uh, Sivir? No, I think uh, maybe a follow-up question. Um, according, I think it, it's really a, a nice, uh, you know, uh, way to, to have a high throughput system and be able to assess, um, you know, uh, to do perform screening. Um, I wonder um, how easy is it to to sample um, in, in these trends oil uh, system? To, to sorry, to sample to to collect effluent um, after oh, an experiment. Very easily because the apical solution is is open and the um, the basal lateral uh, solution is uh, has two reservoirs either side, so you can sample can you can sample which whatever yeah all the time. And that's what we do. So we can sample, for example, for biomarkers, we out of we take about um, 25 microliters out of both sides. For LDH, we take two microliters out of both sides. So yeah, you can sample easily. And for our flux measurements, that's what we do all the time. So essentially, 
um, a flux measurement, you'd start at time zero with, say, a radio label or even a non-radio label and watch its appearance on the contraluminal chamber by sampling it 0, 30, 60, 90, and 120 minutes. So, yeah, it's very simple to do. I think it's probably easier to do in our system than in a, than in a, 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 in a microfluidic chip. Awesome. Um, Elsa, yeah, definitely a different system, different advantages. Um, Elsa, do you want to comment on the Draper side um, about your wells and if they're connected and if you can have um, different conditions per plate? Because I know you guys also have the well yeah. system. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the in the Predict 96 system that I showed, the, the wells are, are not connected. So there are um, independent control of each of those uh, circu recirculating pathways. Uh, and that's what it's, it's sort of different about our system. It is re uh, full recirculating flow um, in each top channel and each bottom channel. Um, we do have versions where you can actually connect uh, at least um, up to two of those devices right now for perhaps a multi-organ integration and in shared media. Yeah. With recirculating flow. Sorry to, to say again, we do have another version in which which we have connected three together. So you can have, and in our system, you can put um, a glomerulus, um, a proximal tubule, and a uh, distal tubule. So you can look at actually the length along the, along the tubule, or else you can put in, you know, you could put in a liver model as well. So we do have it, so you can do both. Awesome. Um, this is also for Elsa. Um, what about scavenger receptors, particularly megalin, cubulin, et cetera, expression on the tubular epithelial cells in your system? I think this was for Elsa. So. Uh, we have looked at megalin before um, and a, a few other transporters uh, and seen nice expression, especially in response to flow. Didn't show, up, didn't show that data. Great. Um, then for, oh, go ahead, Sevier. I see you have your hand um, Yeah. Yes. I, no, I, I don't want to interrupt the flow, but I do have a question for uh, James uh, Hesperos based on the earlier presentation. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Um, I, you know, I, I, I was paying attention to your presentation. I think it's a very interesting system. Um, you know, in my early work, I, I was uh, working in kind of creating the human body in a chip where we connected a different chip model, uh, organ uh, model at Harvard at the Visa Institute, including a, a first pass metabolism study uh, linking to the uh, gut, liver, kidney. Um, I wonder if you wanted to comment, com uh, comment on how you overcome, you know, the different media uh, connection in, in, you know, achieving three organ, uh, five organ, um, you know, uh, in interconnection. Uh, yeah, just yeah, we it's because you know, I've been developing, I banned the use of serum in my lab 25 years ago, so everybody had to always use serum free media, okay. And what we did, we approached it from the standpoint of keeping it simple, you know, the media to be able to start linking things together and then adding complexity on. What's really difficult if you create a multi organ system, it's very complex. OK, and then you try to take another complex multi-organ system and link them together. It's really difficult because you have really um, taken their conditions and really optimize them. Whereas what we did, we started off very simple. OK, and then we optimize them all together. The other point, too, is there's another variable in cell culture. It's not just the cells in the media. It's the surface. So we also tune the surface uh, composition, okay, to also achieve the um, uh, integration. Um, so I have two variables I can play with, with a CM free media for multi-organ systems. I have the cells and I have the surface, okay? Does it make sense? Yeah, it, it does. Um, I, I guess um, I'm curious how you assess the effect of you know, one cell type uh, over on the other. Uh, you, you could imagine that if you, if in one of the uh, organ model, uh, you have certain um, uh, changes that are happening, which leads to production of, you know, either a certain um, soluble molecule that could be uh, potentially detrimental down to downstream organ. 
Um, I wonder how you control for that in, in, you know, in, in, in integrating these different models, uh, organ well, models. Two things. One, we published with L'Oreal a multi-organ system that we took for out for 28 days. And what we found is you monitor the functional, uh, the clinical relevant functional readouts is the cells actually um, help each other, that the individual cultures don't do as well as them linked all together. So not only put out detrimental things, but they also put out supporting things for each other. We've also shown in a cancer liver um, cardiac model that we can actually treat cancer cells for decreasing proliferation at the same time monitoring off-target tox. Okay, and we published that with Roche in Science Translational Medicine, showing that we can look at both the, the, the good effects, but also the bad effects. And then finally, we did a immune, innate immune cell on a, uh, on innate in, uh, immune system on a chip with Roche, where what we did is we treated um, the monocytes, which weren't activated until we treated the um, car cardiac cells with amarodarone to selectively um, cause them to uh, be attacked by the monocytes, but it was a restorative phenotype. We monitored the cytokines for that. And at the same time, we then did the uh, converse experiment where we treated it with uh, bacterial protein, caused an inflammatory response where the immune cells attacked all the organs, and we saw that too. And we saw the different cytokine profile for inflammatory versus uh, uh, restorative. So this is something we're well familiar with, but what it is, you can take advantage of that in terms of your readouts. Awesome, thank you. Um, I do have a question for all of the presenters. Um, some of you have already addressed this, but can you comment on your cell input, um, their like primary versus or immortalized lines, and how they display proximal tubule markers and drug transporters during your culture time? Um, and I'll go ahead and start with Sapan for this one. Okay, well, uh, if you recall, uh, I showed a few slides. Uh, uh, the main one for this question would be uh, a comparison of the human kidney tissue sections that were stained to our chip. And our commercial human kidney chip does use immortalized kidney cells. It uses um, RP techs that are HTER immortalized from Eversight. Um, and We've not yet had any reason to not use these cells. From a tissue engineering standpoint, uh, they make excellent tubules. Um, and when you consider that we're preceding these chips and sending them to customers with fully formed tissue, uh, variability between uh, chip to chip variability has to be low. And this cell line has uh, proven to be extremely good for just stability and low variability. Um, and for every transporter that we've interrogated in the system, we've seen a very in vivo resembling uh, expression pattern, and we're getting some new gene expression and RNA data soon that will uh, reflect on a more granular level the repertoire of gene expression in the in the chip. So we've compared this to primary cells, and we've been able to pretty much get the same result out of primary cells that we do with our h chip. And I think a lot of that is to be owed to the fluidics and the archi architecture in the chip that allows the cells to not come in contact with anything but a biologically relevant ECM. So um, that's that's what we use for our, our, our chips. Awesome. I'll invite um, Elsa to answer the question next. Uh, yes, both, um, both cell types in our proximal tubule model are human and primary. Um, and we do that with most of our models at Draper, and and we do see under, especially under our unidirectional, very user-controlled fluid flow, that we see the the uh, uh, increased level of expression of um, uh, transporters. Awesome, um, Colin, do you want to answer it next? Yeah, our our cells are 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 from uh, primary. They're they're direct from. A transplant grade human kidney, um, and they're less than 18 hours ex vivo, which gives us, in, even in 2D, in static cultures, it gives us expression levels that are extremely good. As Stefan says, uh, one of the problems is if you look at, compare them to RPTEC, RPTEC under static conditions are not very good. The other thing we found is that if you actually passage primary cells, 
then they lose all the transporters. And many, many people have failed because they buy what are so-called primary cells from cell banks. And these primary cells have been passaged at least three times. So they're not primary, so they lose a lot. Um, but I think Stepan has said that, I think in his model, you, you can actually recover some of these uh, effects um, by introducing flow. And certainly as we saw, and in, in, in the other thing we have is of course, we have primary dog, primary rat, primary mouse, and primary NHP as well. So we can do cross species. Um, and we, we showed the data today that shows that if you put our system under flow, we, we've got a great system under static and it's even better under flow. Awesome. Um, James, do you want to answer the question next? Yes, we use primary cells and I showed the data for flow cytometry, immunocytochemistry and transport. You know, we get good function with these systems for both the uh, renal um, tubular cells as well as the glomerulus cells that we're using. Um, and so, but they can be tricky, as, as Colin was saying. You have to be a little careful um, by source. And sometimes, you know, one source was great the last time, is not so good the next time. And so it, it can be very challenging at times to uh, deal with supply chain issues. Thank you. And then last but not least, Xavier. Yeah, no, thank you. I think uh, similarly to what has been said, um, we use primary um, um, cell uh, for both the proximal tubular epithelial cells and the uh, renal microvascular epithelial cells. Um, we we have a very rigorous QC um, uh, qualification system in house uh, to make sure that the cells are performing that performing as expected. As as you know, James just mentioned, uh, sometimes uh, yeah, it's tricky to find um, you know good. A batch that you can actually, you know, control and um, and, and yeah, we, we compare uh, the cells before we using our system, both in the system and in, in plate or trends well, and we've seen very, very good e expression of, of these markers in the function compared to the a static condition. Awesome. Um, then I have a question for Sapant. Um, you have a circular lumen in your system. Have you seen any difference between cells in your system on a curved surface compared to cell cultured on a flat surface? Hmm. Interesting question. Um, well, I that would probably require a comparison of the same cells, uh, which I don't believe we've done. Um, it would be good, and, and that, that is definitely of interest to us. Um, we are currently um, trying to characterize the key differences between, you know, static normal wells, uh, and then wells would flow, and then just grading levels up towards where we get in our chip, where we have, you know, flow, confluent uh, tissue tube with no uh, touching of the, you know, uh, PDMS or anything like that. Um, and yeah, we, we want to interrogate how how much better truly is the uh, perfused tube than, for example, a monolayer in the in the chip, which, by the way, in our chips, you can do. You can scrap the mandrel and just use it as a layered uh, flow chamber, for example. Uh, at the University of Pittsburgh, Lance Taylor's group has developed a four-layer uh, liver sinus uh, model using our chips, and that is not a tubular structure. It is a um, series of matrices with uh, four different cell types embedded within them. So um, we haven't looked at that. We will, and we will probably publish that as a specification of the chip. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I have uh, a question for Xavier. Um, you showed data on clearance of compounds, but is the device not made of PDMS? How can we be sure that what we see is clearance slash breakdown and not absorption? Yeah, it's, this this is a really great question. Um, I was actually answering it in the chat, but um, <clears throat> so we we do very um, detailed assessment of each compound used. Uh, in the chip, uh, mainly looking at the basic chemical properties such as, you know, like the uh, coefficient of partition of the of the molecule, assessing, you know, their lipophilicity. Um, we knew we do know that if the molecule is, um, you know, hydrophobic, it's likely to it's more likely to interact with PDMS. Um, and so we have a method to assess the level of potential interaction and adjust concentration accordingly. Um, and we also control for um, whenever we run, we run an experiment, 
we control for potential as, as, uh, absorption and adsorption in the in the chip. Awesome, and I think you answered this in the chat, but is the early regulation of biomarkers always linked to long-term damage? Yeah, yeah, I think this was a, also had a great question because um, I, I, I would say not always, uh, but I think it's a it's really a great indication. Um, you know, obviously, and these uh, timing is important. Um, so a lot of uh, the time, uh, it, well, it, it takes time to really assess chronic um, kidney diseases. This is why, you know, it, <laughs> it, there is no, um, we don't have an alarm, right, for to, to really understand when kidney, uh, uh, end state kidney disease is, is happening until you get to the, you know, the stage where it's, it's dialysis or a transplant. So um, we do know that some level of injury, uh, you know, eventually has high incidence to become, to lead to, you know, kidney damage, but um, we would need more data in this system, assessing long-term long treatment after an exposure and see if we can generate correlation. But, you know, this, this, this the, the few studies we've done so far seems to indicate um, some relationship, but we, we cannot really establish it with this small sample. Awesome. I did see a raised hand from one of the participants. If you do want me to unmute you so you can answer a question verbally, I can certainly do that. Um, otherwise, you can always have any final questions um, in the Q&A or chat. Um, the other thing that I'm going to do as we are heading towards the end is I am going to put two links in the chat. Um, I'm going to put a link to our um, our web page for MPS, as well as our technology hub. Um, these are always really good places. Um, I will be emailing out there. This has been recorded. Again, I will be emailing that out in the next couple days, um, and as well as the email addresses for all of the presenters. So you can easily contact them. Um, with that, I am not seeing any final questions in the chat and we are right up at the hour so i am going to go ahead and end the meeting um thank you so much to our wonderful presenters um it's always interesting to hear about your systems and your advantages of the systems and how they can be used um thank you so much also for the attendees and the lively discussion so thank you all again have a great day everybody all right take care see you everybody thanks Nick. Okay. thank you everyone Thank Bye. you. Bye.